Dr. Keith Conrad and talk about prime factorization from Euclid from Euclid to another. Okay, thank you. So to begin, since today is March 1st, turns out that actually something very interesting in number theory happened on March 1st a long time ago, namely uh, in 1847, LeMay had announced that he approved Fermat's last theorem. So this was of course problem going back um, to the 1600s. So it was quite well known at that time and had been settled for a few small exponents, um, maybe three, four, perhaps five, but not very much beyond that. And it was known based on the previous work that it would be enough to focus on settling for Miles' last theorem when the exponent is an odd prime. And LeMay's observation was that when P is even just simply odd, then you can factor a sum of two P powers if you allow complex coefficients using a non-trivial p root of unity. So you can write a pth power, if there is a counterexample to Fermat's last theorem, a pth power of an integer as a product of p factors using coefficients with the pth root of unity. And so these numbers here are among expressions of this type, which form a ring. And uh, what LeMay wanted to use was an analog of a property in the positive integers that I'll call the co-prime power property, which says that if you have relatively prime positive integers and a product is a pure power, an nth power of another positive integer, then the two factors are themselves nth powers. And so he had the idea, hey, we have a product of p numbers equal to a p power. If these are suitably relatively prime, they're each p powers perhaps, and that's so many conditions on two numbers x and y that LeMay thought he was able to then derive a contradiction. However, the proof of this co-prime power property in the positive integers uses unique factorization in the integers. And so Liouville raised the question, how do you know that these numbers have an analog of unique factorization? And so, in fact, um, so LeMay did not have a good answer to that. And actually, it turns out that when P is 23, this system of numbers, in fact, does not have unique factorization. So uh, LeMay also, for other reasons, kind of had to abandon his proof. It really um, had some several fatal flaws. But the main one I want to focus on is the fact that he wanted to use the idea of unique factorization beyond the integers but um, unfortunately it did not always hold where he wanted it to be used. So the general statement, of course, of unique factorization in the integers, that we can write every number as a product of primes bigger than one, and two different products of primes have to be the same up to the, or the same number of terms and up to the ordering. We can relabel, re-index everything so the primes match term by term. So, uh, and of course we usually collect like primes together so we have primes with multiplicity, but that's not so important for the statement of unique factorization. So three things to address is actually how far back does unique factorization go? Who first perceived that it was something worth uh, proving? What good is it? What can you do with it besides just proving it? And then what's the scope to which statements like unique factorization have been demonstrated in settings beyond just the integers, so we already saw LeMay had wanted to use it for certain systems of complex numbers where it doesn't necessarily hold. So the uh, basic results about prime numbers go back to the ancient Greeks. You open up Euclid's elements, of course, it's most famous for being about geometry, lots of results in plain geometry, but two parts of Euclid's elements are concerned with factoring and prime numbers. So he defines, Euclid defines the prime in the usual way, a number bigger than one with no proper factor other than one. And then he proves a bunch of results about primes. It divides a product, means it divides one of the parts. Every integer above one has a prime factor. And then other properties, they're all geometrically described, but if you reinterpret them algebraically, which is a prime going into a power, goes into the base, a divisor of a prime power must be a power of that prime. And if a prime goes into the least common multiple of a whole bunch of primes, 
it must be one of those primes. And then the, maybe the most famous result in the elements about prime numbers is that there are infinitely many primes, but that's not something that we're going to be concerned with today. And if you look at these results, you notice that none of them say that every number has a prime factorization. So this one comes closest. Every number has a prime factor. And so by induction, you can get a product of primes. But Euclid did not actually state the result as every number having a prime factorization. And he also never states a result about uniqueness. But these kinds of results here demonstrate that he had some idea that there was certain kind of basic uniqueness in how a number could be exhibited as um, products involving prime numbers. But again, there was no precise statement that we'd call today unique factorization. And in fact, generally, there was nothing in the elements that relied on unique factorization. So it's not maybe so much of a surprise that the statement of unique factorization never appears there. If you want to find an actual statement of unique factorization, you have to jump ahead um, a thousand plus years. And here are several books on algebra and number theory before 1800 in which you can at least find the statement that numbers are products of primes, but uh, in none of them was there any statement about the uniqueness. So what did people like Alfarisi or Euler need prime factorization for? What did they do with it? So after they stated the existence of prime factorization, one common thing they all did was use it to list what are the factors of a number. And so for that, we clearly want something like unique factorization since right 1881 is a product of primes. And of course, since three appears twice and um, 11 and 19 appear once, any factor will have to be built out of them with bounds based on their appearance in 1881. And so you can read off the number of prime, the number of factors from unique factorization. It would be hard to count the number of factors if the prime factorization was not unique. If you write a number of powers of distinct primes, then you can just read off what the divisors look like, their prime factorization, so you can count prime factors if you have unique factorization. If you didn't, then, of course, this would be an undercount. So, um, so they, they basically wanted to use unique factorization. They implicitly were assuming it. Who was the first person to actually state it explicitly? As usual, number theory this goes, oh, sorry. I was thinking ahead, the next slide would go to Gauss, but let me um, point out that another place that Euler used prime factorization in terms of uniqueness was when he factored the zeta function into an Euler product. Since if we take this product over primes and we look at all the factors and expand them into geometric series and then multiply everything together and ignore convergence since we're Euler in the 1700s, then you see that the reason that we recover every reciprocal power exactly once is because every product of primes leads to a different number. So if we didn't have unique factorization, we get some numerators other than one here. So I'm not saying Euler recognized this at play, but kind of implicitly, he was using unique factorization in this setting and analysis as well as previously when he was working with factors of numbers in algebra. So Gauss was the first person to put in writing an explicit statement of unique factorization in 1801 in his big book on number theory. And this was the statement of it here in the original Latin or in English, saying every composite number can be written only in one way as a product of primes. So if you're going to attribute the statement, the recognition of the importance of unique factorization as something worth proving to somebody, then as usual, it should be to Gauss. So the key step goes back to Euclid that a prime and a product must be in one of the parts. And Gauss really criticized all of his contemporaries for not recognizing, having maybe forgotten about this basic property of primes. Moreover, not realizing that, not admitting that unique factorization was something that had to be shown and not just assumed. But of course, at that time, it was understandable that people would assume unique factorization because it's hard to appreciate that something like that could possibly go wrong. I mean, it seems to work. And so nobody really saw that it was something that was worth spending time trying to rigorously demonstrate. But later on, 
one of Gauss's later works, it became understandable that we really did need to prove unique factorization because the concept could be applied beyond just the setting of integers. So 30 years later, Gauss introduced the Gaussian integers, C bracket I, and so here he would factor into smaller parts, and these are numbers that at the time people do ever other than Gauss think about factoring or treating algebraically like you would in number theory, doing modular arithmetic, talking about primes. And so since this is a totally new, unfamiliar setting, then people realize that actually unique factorization is something we have to prove just to make sure it still works here. So for example, here I've written 10 as a product in two different ways. And at first, this might look like a counterexample to unique factorization, because we have two times five and a diff totally different product, but this is not a counterexample because none of the factors are prime. They all break up. Two breaks up, five breaks up, and three plus or minus i both break up. So this is an analog of like in the integer is saying, hey, 210 is six times 35 and 10 times 21. So the integers don't have unique factorization, which of course is wrong. Um, so the new thing that happens here is the concept of prime we realize is a relative notion. In the setting of Z bracket I, two and five are no longer prime, they break up. On the other hand, three does stay prime. So one has to try to figure out which of the primes and is unique factorization actually true. So we have the universal factors in Z bracket I of plus or minus one and plus or minus I, they are factors of everything. So if we want to talk about unique factorization, then we need to allow these as ambiguous factors, plus or minus one and plus or minus I. So following Gauss, a prime would be anything, any number P other than these universal factors of everything, whose only factors are the universal ones and P times the universal factors. So the primes start off these two lists, and it includes some familiar numbers like three and seven up to multiplication by plus or minus one or plus or minus i. And then we have new numbers that are coming from factoring of two and five and 13 and so forth. So the statement of unique factorization is just like in the integers, except when we want to compare two different products of primes, they're not necessarily equal up to re-indexing, but up to re-index, and they're equal up to further multiplication by these extra universal factors. For example, if we factor seven plus four i into one plus two i and three minus two, and three minus two i, we can factor it also in a second way into primes. And these two factorizations can be linked through scaling by i and minus i. So we have this extra aspect that we have to remember that things are unique, not just up to ordering, but also up to scaling by plus or minus one and plus or minus i. So with that understood, then we recover a statement of unique factorization by Gauss. So how are we gonna use this? Well, in the integers I'd mentioned before, we have this co-prime power property. Any, any product of relatively prime integers equal to a power, they are both themselves powers to the same extent, but if we're working in Z rather than Z plus, we should allow some ambiguity with some plus or minus signs, like negative four times negative nine is six squared, but negative four, negative nine are not themselves squares, although they are up to sign. So in Z bracket I, because the proof of the co-prime power property uses unique factorization, and in Z bracket I, we have unique factorization, we have the same results there too. Product of relatively prime elements of Z bracket I is a nth power. The two parts are themselves nth powers up to multiplication by numbers that multiply to one, namely plus or minus one and plus or minus i. So of what use is the co-prime power property? So I'll show you how we can use this property in Z bracket i to say something in the ordinary integers. Suppose we want to understand Pythagorean triples. A squared plus B squared is C squared. And let's just focus on the case when A and B are relatively prime. Well, in Z bracket I, I can factor the left-hand side, A plus B I, A minus B I. And it turns out when A and B are relatively prime integers, 
that these factors here on the left side are themselves relatively prime in Z bracket I. So by the co-prime power property, these factors on the left must themselves be squares since their product is a square, or at least they're squares up to plus or minus one and plus or minus I. So let's see what happens if A plus B I is a square. If A plus B I is a square, write it as K plus L I squared and expand them out. Then by looking at the sum of two squares, we get a real part and an imaginary part. And if we equate the real and imaginary parts with A plus B I, we discover A must be a difference of squares and B is 2 K L. So what we find then is that C squared, plugging in these formulas, is A squared plus B squared. And algebraically, the sum of those two numbers squared is K squared plus L squared all squared. So taking square roots, C is the sum of two squares. So in fact, we get a parametric description of A, B, and C in terms of unknown integers, K and L. For instance, if K is two and L is one, then this triple becomes the usual three, four, five. So um, what we find then is using factorization properties in Z bracket I, we can derive properties just to the ordinary integers that don't mention Z bracket I. So this can also then be used, for instance, if you wanted to understand the equation A squared plus B squared is C cubed, then you can go through the same method, letting the right side be a cube, and you get a similar parametric description of solutions to that equation. So anything about sums of two squares, you can usually understand very well by working in Z bracket I. Let me show you a different example of using the co-prime power property in Z bracket I to understanding uh, some polynomial equations, finding the integer solutions. So we'll look at this Mordell equation, Y squared is X cubed minus four, and some small solutions and in integers are two and two and five and 11, the Y, of course, only matters up to sign. And let's show using the co-prime power property in Z bracket I that these are the only integer solutions. And the trick is to move the four to the other side to write X cubed as a sum of two squares and factor it in Z bracket I. So what we now have is a product of two numbers in Z bracket I equal to a cube. So if Y is odd, then those two factors are relatively prime, and that would mean that essentially y plus 2i has to be a cube. And if y is even, then the two factors on the right are no longer relatively prime, but you can use some arguments to show that the same conclusion follows. It still must be a cube. So we don't know what k and l are. There just must be another element in z bracket i that cubes to y plus 2i. So if we equate the real and imaginary parts of K plus L I cubed, then we find formulas for Y and formulas for two, but that formula for two has a factor, an overall outside factor of L, which means L is restricted to plus or minus one or plus or minus two. And so then you can feed that back in to see if you can solve for K as an integer. And it turns out sometimes you can, and sometimes you can't. And when you can, you discover the solutions that we were looking for. So by using the co-prime power property for cubes in Z bracket I, we found all the integer solutions to a certain polynomial equation just in Z, all right? So, so this is illustrating that using unique factorization and its consequences beyond the integers can help us to solve problems just about the integers themselves. Unfortunately, the co-prime power property doesn't always work. So let's take a look at Z bracket squared and minus three. And here we can, of course, multiply and factor. And we have an example of one plus root minus three times one minus root minus three is two times two. So in this setting, it turns out on the left side, the only factors are plus or minus one that are common to the two parts. And unfortunately, these two factors are not a square up to a plus or minus sign. So although we have a product of two numbers with no common factors equal to a square, their individual parts are not squares up to sign. 
And so, um, unfortunately, the uh, co-prime power property doesn't work. Well, the only proof of the co-prime power property uses unique factorization. So actually what this shows is there's not unique factorization in Z bracket root minus three. And in fact, this very equation is an example of non-unique factorization because two and one plus or minus root minus three don't decompose in Z root minus three. So they're all prime and their products are equal, but they, the two sides are not the same primes up to a plus or minus sign. And in fact, we have the phenomenon here that a prime like two can divide a product of two parts, one plus root minus three and one minus root minus three without being a factor of either part individually. So this is totally unlike the integers. So when unique factorization breaks down, you can have primes being very much unlike what we're used to in the integers. And it certainly took time for people to appreciate what was going on here. Now, another setting where we have co-prime power property not working occurs with functions. Well, it doesn't occur with polynomials. Polynomials, of course, you can factor uniquely, this time up to scaling. So we have three different factorizations of one minus X squared, but they're all related to each other by scaling by a non-zero constant. So there's no problem with unique factorization with polynomials, but if we consider the system T of, I'll say trigonometric polynomials, or for analysts in the audience, and I prefer to talk about finite Fourier series, but polynomials and sine and cosine, then if we take the standard trig identity, sine squared plus cosine squared is one, and we write it as one plus sine times one minus sine is cosine squared, well, then this is an example of non-unique prime factorization. As trigonometric polynomials, one plus sine or one minus sine and cosine do not decompose, and the product of the two terms on the left is a perfect square, but the two terms on the left are not squares up to a plus or minus sign. So this is very much like the numerical counterexample to unique factorization, but here it's occurring with trigonometric polynomials. So in fact, everyone has seen a setting of non-unique factorization in high school when you study trigonometry, but for some reason, this aspect of them is usually not mentioned. All right, so um, besides the co-prime power property, there's, which was a consequence of unique factorization and its failure would highlight that something cannot have unique factorization. There's another really important, maybe more important consequence of unique factorization, which I'll call the rational roots property. So the rational roots theorem would say in the integers that if you have a monic polynomial with integer coefficients, that any rational root must be an integer. The proof of this uses unique factorization, being able to write ratios in reduced form. And since there's unique factorization in Z bracket I, the rational roots theorem has an analog, a monic polynomial with Z bracket I coefficients that has a root in Q bracket I must have that root in Z bracket I. The same proof goes through. However, Z root minus three does not have this property. In Q root minus three, we have one half plus one half root minus three, and that's a root of X squared minus X plus one, which is monic with coefficients in Z root minus three. I mean, they're also in Z, but I'm just gonna say that they're in Z root minus three. So here you have a monic with coefficients in here, and it has a root in Q root minus three, but that root is not in Z root minus three. So this rational root property fails for Z root minus three, which is consistent with it not having unique factorization. Now you could fix the problem here by enlarging the system with this extra number, one half plus one half root minus three, call it omega. And if you work instead in Z bracket omega, that actually has the rational roots property. And in fact, it has unique factorization. So in this case, we can actually fix the failure of unique factorization in Z root minus three by simply enlarging the system a little bit. But unfortunately, we can't always do that in other settings. So for instance, in Z root minus five, it has the rational roots property, but it has 
non-unique factorization. So what happens here is that even though the rational roots property works, and I had said it's a consequence of unique factorization, that doesn't mean that it implies unique factorization. You can have examples like Z root minus five, where you don't have unique factorization, and here are two counterexamples, two examples of numbers with different prime factorizations where the, um, the rational root property holds, but, but unique factorization doesn't hold. So we can have that happen. And in fact, quite generally, for any non-square integer, if we take Z bracket root D, that there are lots of examples listed along the bottom where the rational root property holds, but unique factorization does not hold. Not just Z root minus five, but many, many other examples. So we might think of the rational root property as being a consequence of unique factorization, and it is, but it can hold even if unique factorization doesn't. So people in the 19th century wanted to, once they understood that this is a very widespread problem, they wanted to find a way to fix it. And so Dedekind in the second half of the 1800s found a way to fix unique factorization. And his idea was building on work of Coomer from the mid 1800s was to change what it is that we're going to factor. Instead of factoring individual elements, he realized that we should be factoring sets of elements. And the key point is to take a look at what it means to be a multiple of something. So if you take an element gamma in Z root D and look at its multiples, the multiples of a fixed element gamma are closed under adding and subtracting, and they're also closed under multiplying by everything in Z bracket root D. These properties, though, don't make any reference to being the multiples of something, and so we can just think about sets of numbers that have these properties, right? And so this is what an ideal is. It's closed under adding and subtracting. It's an additive group, and it absorbs all the multiplication from Z bracket root D. So this is where ideals first came from in this kind of a setting, trying to fix the failure of unique factorization. And of course, the multiples of an individual element are an ideal. That's the principal ideals. But if we can have non-principal ideals. We can have subsets like the linear combinations in Z root minus five of two and one plus root minus five, two and one, three and one plus root minus five, and three and one minus root minus five that of course are closed under adding and subtracting. Of course, they're closed under multiplying by everything, but these are not the multiples of an individual element. So we have these non-principal ideals. Principal ideals are like elements and non-principal ideals are something new. So we've expanded our concept of what it is we're gonna work with when we try to multiply and factor. So we can multiply ideals by just taking all the elements in one ideal, all the elements in the other ideal, multiply them and just add them up however we can. And that's also an ideal. It fits the defining conditions. And the product of two principal ideals is principal, which is like multiplying numbers. But we can also have the phenomenon for these ideals that I mentioned on the previous slide, that if you multiply non-principal ideals, they become principal in this example. So these three non-principal ideals, I, J, and J prime, can appear in, have products rather, that equal the principal ideals of two and three and one plus or minus root minus five. So it's like we've discovered hidden factors that if we only use numbers, two doesn't break up. But if we think of two as a principal ideal, then it does break up into non-principal ideals, just like a real polynomial might not factor as a real polynomial, but if you think about it as a complex polynomial, now you're in a setting where it breaks up further. So by using non-principal ideals, Dedekind was able to fix the problem of non-unique factorization. So if we go back to the example I mentioned before of non-unique factorization in Z root minus five, two times three is one plus root minus five times one minus root minus five, on both sides, these are genuinely different prime factorizations. But if we pass to the multiples of the numbers on both sides, 
to think about them as principal ideals, then on the left hand side, two times three breaks up into I squared times JJ prime. And on the right side, one plus root minus five and one minus root minus five, instead of multiples as an ideal, breaks up into ij and ij prime. So this failure as an equation of elements just becomes the simple rearrangement of factors as an equation of ideals. i squared times jj prime is ij times ij prime. Easy peasy, right? And uh, so what we see here is this is very much like the bogus factorization, well, not bogus, but the non-prime factorization of 210 that I mentioned before in Z, the different parts break up and you can rearrange them using primes to see that it's really the same factorization if you drill down a little bit further. So to get ideal factorization, we need prime ideals. And so Dedekind took a cue from, to define prime ideals, he took a cue from what happens in the integers where if A divides B, then the multiples of A contain the multiples of B. These are equivalent conditions, like the multiples of two contain the multiples of six is what it means to say six is even in terms of their multiples. And so he would define a prime ideal by using reverse containment as a substitute for divisibility. So he would call an ideal prime if it's not the set zero and it's not everything, it's like it's not zero or one, and it has the property that if it contains a product of any two ideals, then it must contain one of them. It's like saying if P divides AB, it must divide A or it must divide B. And with this notion, the ideals on the previous slide, IJ and J prime are all prime ideals. And those factorizations that I mentioned of the principal ideals for two and three and one plus root minus five and one minus root minus five are all factorizations into prime ideals. So now using non-principal ideals, we found a setting where we get prime factorization with ideals and we can compare them and see that they're essentially the same in disguise. So this was one of Dedekind's great discoveries that as long as Z bracket root D has that rational roots property, which I'd mentioned before would be a consequence of unique factorization, and as long as that property holds, in fact, the ideals, not the elements, but the ideals have unique factorization into prime ideals. And um, moreover, the only time that you have unique factorization of elements is exactly when the ideals don't give you anything new, when all the ideals are principal. So there's really no difference between elements and ideals in terms of factoring. And this is nothing special about these quadratic settings of Z bracket root D. He did this in a much more general setting of rings of algebraic integers and number fields, but I'm just focusing on this case for, for simplicity. So um, one way to think about what Dedekind had done by using the ideals is that he's kind of made possible what seemed impossible before, fixing the failure of unique factorization. But this is a common theme that happens in many areas in mathematics, right? First, people can't solve polynomial equations, but then when you create complex numbers, suddenly everything that didn't have roots now has roots. Or in geometry, certain geometric configurations, like maybe two parallel lines don't intersect. So you go to the projective plane from the ordinary plane, and now you have much nicer intersection properties. Any two lines will intersect. Or as we've seen with ideals, if elements don't factor uniquely into primes, then in many settings, you can fix that by using factorization of ideals instead of factorization of elements. Or if you go further in analysis, you reinterpret the meaning of differentiation, say using distributions, so the things that used to not have a derivative in the classical sense, now you can differentiate them, in fact, internally often. So we constantly enlarge our context to be able to do things that we thought we were unable to do before. And this approach to fixing factorization with ideals was not the only method that was found. Okay, around the same time in the late 1800s, Dedekind created this approach using ideals, but also Kronecker had an approach using what he called divisors, which is the source of divisors in algebraic geometry today. And uh, Zolotarov created a method using semi-local rings, which is not that widely um, discussed in the literature on um, factorizations, but it was an independent separate approach 
that ultimately all these methods in the setting of numbers amounted to the same thing, but they had their advantages if you go beyond beyond them to other settings. Okay, so if we go ahead from the 1800s into the 1900s, uh, we finally reached uh, the work of Emmy Nether on um, ideals. So when she started off, her PhD thesis was on invariant theory, and she did pages and pages of calculations to do things, and ultimately she really wasn't very happy with this kind of style of mathematics. And then under the um, uh, correspondence or communication with Ernst Fischer, was most well known in analysis for the uh, theorem, but he was at the time working in algebra. Fisher's thesis was on determinants. He had kind of directed Nether to look at the work of Hilbert, kind of the more conceptual abstract approach to uh, working with polynomials and other objects in algebra. And so in the 1920s, Nether uh, really pushed this idea very far. And she had a series of very important groundbreaking papers on ideals in different contexts. And in particular, for instance, the early 1920s, she introduced what's called the primary ideal decomposition for all Noetherian rings, which is a vast generalization of unique factorization, which is especially useful in algebraic geometry or polynomial rings. And towards the end of the 1920s, she looked at the setting of ideals as a source for prime, unique prime factorization and pinpointed exactly which settings you can have unique factorization of ideals. This is a screenshot of the uh, beginning of her paper about the abstract structure of ideal theory, break number fields and function fields. So what was it that Nether had done? So here's kind of a short version of one of her main results in this paper. When do you have unique factorization of ideals? She showed that it happens in an integral domain exactly when First, you need an analog of that rational roots property. And then the other conditions were much more abstract. The second one, every chain of ideals, every increasing sequence of ideals, one contained in the next, must eventually stabilize. This is the Noetherian condition. And then the third property, and I should say the second property is the analog, although it doesn't look like it. The second property is the analog of saying every number is a product of finitely many primes. And the third property is that the different prime ideals don't contain each other. And I, I should say that nowadays we're used to talking about the zero ideal in an integral domain as being prime, but back then Dedekind didn't think about it and I mean, Nether didn't either. So I'll just phrase it in that um, earlier style. The non-zero, if you want to put it that way, prime ideals don't have any containment relations. None is inside the other. That's sort of like saying in the integers, two different prime numbers can't divide each other. And so with these three conditions, in fact, it's true. Dedekind's original paper on ideals, for him an ideal was an infinite subset that had certain properties. So it took some time for the vocabulary to stabilize to what we, what we use today. So um, as an example, beyond the setting of numbers, let's take a look again at the case of trigonometric polynomials, where we had seen that there's not unique factorization into trigonometric factors. So what happens here? So the setting of trigonometric polynomials turns out to have all three of these conditions, and so it must have unique factorization of ideals. So what does that mean in terms of this counterexample to unique factorization here? So we'll introduce uh, a few ideals. Let I be the ideal of linear combinations with trigonometric polynomial coefficients of one plus sine theta and cosine theta. And we'll let J be the ideal, similar ideal involving linear combinations of one minus sine theta and cosine theta with trigonometric polynomial multiplying factors. So we have these two ideals, and it turns out if you square I, you get all the multiples of one plus sine. If you square J, you get all the multiples of one minus sine. And if you multiply i and j, you get all the multiples of cosine. And so this counterexample to unique factorization of elements up here, if you look at their multiples on both sides to turn them into ideals, then the left-hand side just breaks up into um, i squared times j squared, and the right-hand side 
just breaks up into ij times ij. And i and j are prime ideals, and so now we see that as ideals, this equation that was bad for elements, in fact, is just a rearrangement of different prime ideals that are, of course, not principal, so we couldn't have seen them if we only looked at elements and factoring those. So how, besides the saving of unique factorization in many settings, if we use ideals, how can the concept of ideals and their unique factorization be used to do something else? So I have four examples here to point out to end this uh, presentation. So the first one is if we go back to the co-prime power property that we had seen that sometimes it doesn't work, but actually you can save it in many cases by using ideal factorization. Namely, say z root minus five, if you have two non-zero elements, alpha and beta, if the ideals they generate are relatively prime as ideals, then we have the co-prime power property of elements that if their product is an nth power, then the two elements themselves, in fact, even though z root minus five doesn't have unique factorization, by using ideals to take into that into account, you can show nevertheless the individual factors alpha and beta must themselves be nth powers up to sign as long as the exponent n is odd. So we don't get the full co-prime power property, but we do get it for odd powers. And we did already see an example where it breaks for exponent two. So it doesn't always hold, but we can use ideals to show that the element-wise co-prime power property does hold for um, odd powers, odd exponents n. Another application in linear algebra, well, we have a standard fact that if we're working over a field, that every matrix is conjugate to its transpose. And this is one of the standard consequences of Jordan canonical form, rational canonical form. And people who spend their lives working with matrices over a field might just think, well, it's, it's always gonna happen. Matrices are conjugate to the transposes. But if you ask about whether this property of being conjugate to the transpose is true, over the integers, the answer is no. There are integral matrices that are not integrally conjugate to their transposes. So here's a two by two matrix, one minus five, three minus one. It is of course conjugate to its transpose with rational matrices as it must be, but it is not conjugate to its transpose if you only allow the conjugating matrices to have integral entries. And the way this example is found, the way I found it, is that the characteristic polynomial of this equation is x root plus 14. Z root minus 14, which is a root of the characteristic polynomial, does not have unique factorization of elements, but it does of ideals. And by converting the question of conjugacy of A and A transpose into a question of ideals, you can then use your understanding of ideals in this ring to discover these examples. Okay, so this can be converted into a problem about ideals and then solved using those. Two last examples. Go back to the problem that LeMay had encountered that the system of cyclotomic integers when P is prime, that these combinations of powers of P root of unity do not necessarily have unique factorization. I had said that the um, failure occurs when P is 23. And this was known back in the mid 1800s, but in the 1970s, using the fact that they have unique factorization of ideals, even if they don't have elements, it was shown that in fact, these systems of numbers don't have unique factorization of elements for any prime starting at 23, 23 on up. They all fail to have unique factorization of elements. The proof uses algebraic and analytic number theory and depends heavily on the fact that at least we have unique factorization of ideals and then we can take advantage of that property. The uh, last thing I wanna mention is a connection to geometry, which is that the very algebraic notion of an ideal turns out to be closely related to the very geometric notion of a line bundle on a curve. And in fact, we think about trigonometric polynomials and sine and cosine as like polynomial functions on a circle, then it turns out that the possibility of having a non principal ideal among the trigonometric polynomials turns out to be equivalent 
to the possibility of having a non-trivial line bundle on a circle, and that's just what the Mobius strip is. You can take a line and move it around a circle so that locally everything looks like a little piece of the plane, but when you come back, the whole thing has turned upside down. So locally everything is nice, but globally something is turned and twisted. And this phenomenon in geometry, it turns out to be equivalent to the phenomenon in algebra of having an ideal that doesn't have an individual generator. And so I think I will stop there. Thanks.